All right, continuing on, we're going to, in our second half here, we're going to talk about Amy Grant. And I just published this article yesterday. Many of you saw it, or maybe maybe you didn't look into it. Maybe you didn't have time, I don't know. Uh, but I posted this last night, and this has taken me a number of weeks to get through. Um, I started looking into this originally, and, and I know I just did the, the Michael W. Smith one. I, I can't remember when, but we, we just went over that in audio a, a few weeks back. But... The reason I did Amy Grant is because I had so many, uh, a surprising number of people in, e in emails and in messages ask me about Amy Grant all of a sudden. Now, I really didn't know why they were asking me about Amy Grant so much after, right after I did Michael W. Smith until I realized, okay, Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith apparently go on tour together. And I didn't even, until I did research on this, I didn't even know their, their history all the way back to the 80s. Uh, they have a long history. So a lot of people were asking me about Amy Grant and... A lot of people are going to be really angry with me. They, you thought they were angry with me about Michael W. Smith. Wait till they read this one. Because this is... Look, folks, I have to make a little disclaimer here again. All right, I do this with every one of our wolf things so people don't get the wrong idea. I fervently believe that Amy Grant is hiding behind the covering of a Christian. She's, a, she's posing as a sheep, but she is not one of us. Okay? I am not saying that anybody who's ever listened to Amy Grant is unsaved. You're not going to hell because you ever listened to Amy Grant. I'm not saying that no one has ever been born again saved at an Amy Grant event. I am not saying everyone who works with Amy Grant is unsaved. What I'm going to talk about today is specifically about Amy Grant. So what I'm saying is that there is little to no evidence of Grant's worship of the Christian God of the Bible and a lot of evidence of Grant's worship of a false idol she calls Jesus. Okay, Because the Jesus Christ she's talking about here... And when she describes it in the things that she teaches, is a completely different from the Jesus Christ I know in the Word of God. And folks, I mean, it, I realize that a lot of people are going to get angry at this. I know there's people who are going to have the hate mail. And look, I used to listen to Amy Grant all the time. I really liked her music. But we need to learn to love the Lord Jesus Christ enough to put aside our childish personal feelings and look at the facts to gain understanding. In 1 Corinthians 14.20 says, Brethren, be, be not children in understanding. Right? Put off the childish things. How be it in malice be children. That means, I mean, it's so funny. That's the exact opposite. People write me this hate mail so angry at me for writing about this stuff. See, because they're not, they're not children in their malice. They get so vindictive about this stuff because it's their personal feelings they're trying to protect here. But, it, but the Bible says, but in understanding be men. So I'm just a a requesting that when people go over this, folks, be adults about this. And let's look at this from the perspective of the Word of God, okay? Just like we prayed at the beginning of the first half, that, you know, God would let us see the world as you see it. That's what we're looking for. Let's see the world and, and let's look at these people through the eyes of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Amy Grant's got a very popular song, a lot of you are probably familiar with, called Thy Word. And Amy Grant says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path in her song. I mean, it sounds good to everybody. They think, oh, wow, that sounds really so Christian and biblical. And it may be. But in an interview with Ladies Home Journal, here's what Amy Grant said. Quote, It seems to me that people who are most adamantly against premarital sex have experienced some kind of pain in their own lives. End quote. Now, in context, in case you're not understanding what she's saying here, she's saying premarital sex is perfectly okay, and if you have a problem with that, you've just there's just been something wrong in your life. You must have suffered some abuse or something so that you're not comfortable with it. You see, Grant is saying that premarital sex is an acceptable practice. Why would she preach about God's word being a lamp into our feet and a light into our path and then turn around and say something like that? You see, in Acts 15.20, it says but, but w that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication. You see, premarital sex is fornication. And the Bible speaks over and over against fornication. Well, uh, excuse me, assuming that you have the correct Bible, which Amy Grant does not, and I will show you later what Bible version she reads from, if you're curious. But keep listening if you want to find out. And 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Okay, To have a pure heart and flee the youthful lust of fornication. But that is not what Amy Grant actually teaches. They said, but she sings it in her song. 
Well, I use the term her song very loosely. Amy Grant has not written a lot of the songs that you think she's written, okay? And the ones that she has written, we're going to find out in a little bit, don't really teach the gospel of Jesus. Now, I hope I can get through this today. You guys have to be patient with me. I did, I did end our first half a little earlier than I wanted to, but that's because I don't think that Amy Grant is worth spending any more than a week on. Or than, not one week, but I mean just today, okay? I've spent weeks working on this. I have her stupid music stuck in my head, and I can't stand talking about this woman anymore. I really don't want anything more to do with her uh, after I've read a lot of this. So there's a really popular song she came out with called Baby Baby. And a lot of you are very familiar with this song because it was, I mean, when I was growing up, it was number one on, like, the Billboard, cha- like, their their top 100 or whatever. She was number one for over 30 weeks. Two-thirds of a year, she was at number one. Now, that's, okay, first of all, I want you guys to stop and consider. How satanically influenced do you have to be to get to number one on anything that Hollywood or American music industry has. You have got to be really, really deep into the wickedness of something in order to get that high. You have got to have Satan's backing in order to get on those charts. And People Magazine, when they described her video, they said, quote, There's saintly Amy cuddling some hunky guy crooning baby baby into his ear and looking pretty sleek and sinful, end quote. Because they saw her saintly at the time because, okay, this young Christian girl coming in singing these gospel songs, and then she gets into all this. Well, you see, because if you watch the video, and I really, if you watch it, turn off the music again, okay? Do not listen to that. I have that stupid song. I have woken up so many mornings with that dumb song stuck in my head since I've been doing research on this, and I can't stand it. I want to get away from it, okay? But if you actually watch it, just turn off the, turn off the music. There's a little mute button on the video there that I provided on the website. And again, oh, I forgot to mention, if you're following along, you can go onto our website. Just type in the word Amy Grant into the search bar, or you, if you're listening by YouTube, just click the link in the description and follow along. So in that video, you will see here, one of the first things she does when she, she's walking down the street, she's given this guy flirtatious looks, and the guy is with his significant other, whoever this is, get, going to give her give his significant other a gift, and she's walking by, glancing at this guy, giving him these flirty looks, and then the guy turns around, takes the gift from his significant other, and starts chasing after Amy Grant. Okay, is this the example, mothers, that you want your daughters you know, doing these kind of things? Do you think this is approved by the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would approve of, of, of women doing that kind of thing? I don't think so. But that's the betrayals that she's giving in the video. And we have to understand, as we're going to read in a lot of what Amy Grant is doing, her mentality has been about sex since she was young. And I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here. That kind of, what she's showing in that video is a reflection of her actual character and where her foundations really lie. And so first of all, what I want to uh, mention about this Baby Baby song is that there is no gospel in this whatsoever, okay? Which is why this goes to the top of the charts. They're like, oh, okay, this is, you know, the world just absolutely loves this kind of thing. And she's focusing on using sex to sell her albums. Now, of course, Amy Grant fans will say, oh, I, I object to that. That's not true. She's not like that. Well, what she told Rolling Stone magazine was that, quote, I'm trying to look sexy to sell a record, end quote. How much more direct do you need to be? All right. Now, Matthew chapter 5, verse 28 says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Well, what does that tell us when she's trying to look sexy to sell a record? I want you to imagine that Amy Grant put out her, her CDs or, or, or record albums, whatever they were at the time, okay? The tapes at the time, I think. is Yeah, the, the tape player was really in back then when I was younger. So she's putting out these tapes. On the cover of them, let's say she didn't put anything. It was a blank cover, maybe just white or black, and it said Amy Grant and the title of the thing. And that's all they put on there. How many... Of those tapes would they have sold? Not a lot. But when they put a woman on the front of it, try to make her look sexy and make her look desperate and all this kind of thing, then suddenly she sells more. 
Folks, if you think that sex appeal does not sell more products, you are delusional, okay? This is why it is, it is so commonly used in the sale of almost everything in this country. Talk to an advertising, uh, like, a, like a marketer or an advertiser, somebody who works in the advertisement industry. They will show you this stuff sells a lot. So basically what Amy Grant is doing is she is causing men, she wants men to commit adultery so she can turn a profit. Not only is she doing the sin herself, she is encouraging others to sin when looking upon her so she can make more money from it. Is this, I mean, and people are like, well, this doesn't sound like the Amy Grant I know. That's because most of you have only listened to her music. You haven't gone in to see what she teaches. And again, the Lord Jesus Christ has taught us to look at their doctrine, not to look at how sweet and soft and beautiful her melody sounds. That's not the, the determining factor Jesus Christ told us to judge these matters. Amy Grant was in, a, was in a concert in front of a crowd of 30,000 fans, which were mostly college and high school students. And to comfort any nervous feelings they may have had about her being a Christian and this being a Christian concert, she tried to open them up to their sexual feelings by saying, quote, We're sitting there. I do my sound check. All these girls are in halter tops, great figures. Everybody's wearing nothing. I'm 18, and I know what they're thinking. I really want to know know Jesus, and I really want to love him, except my hormones are on 10, and I see you all sitting out there getting chummy and praying together, and we're horny. My, my feeling is why fake it. I'm not trying to be gross. I'm saying let's just be honest about what's coming down, end quote. Well, I have some questions. Number one, why were there a bunch of girls dancing around stage in skimpy outfits to begin with? How is that biblical? And First Timothy uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 9, says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh woman professing godliness with good works. Okay, what they're saying is if you want to decorate yourselves, ladies, decorate yourselves with good works, is what Jesus Christ is saying. See, Grant doesn't care what the word of God says about these things. She's baiting others into their sin. And she t and and you know people still will object to that. Well, here's what she told People Magazine. Okay, she said, "quote Christians can be sexy. What I'm doing is a good thing." End quote. She thinks what she's doing is a good thing when the Bible says what she's doing is evil. But you see, that's what I'm saying is that Amy Grant's mentality has never been about the Word of God. Amy Grant's mentality is over her personal feelings, her personal emotions, her personal thoughts. Her brain is her God. Her heart is her God. It's not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. And most Amy Grant fans, again, will rage at me for saying such things because, oh, they're saying, but she's sharing the gospel through her music. Well, maybe she, you ought to read what she told the Los Angeles Times. She said, quote, I'm a singer, not a preacher. I'm not looking to convert anybody, end quote. I didn't say that, folks. Amy Grant said that. When asked about her music and what she's doing with it, she says, I am not trying to convert anybody. She doesn't really want to lead anybody to the Lord Jesus Christ. She has no interest in that. And we'll find out later some more details of what really she's doing all this for. Amy Grant was with Michael W. Smith, and just like I was talking about earlier, the two have done a lot together. And there was a recent tour that they did, I, I forget what it's called, but the two of them, you know, getting together and all your your churchianity church going fanboys and fangirls are like oh yay you know they follow them around and wear purchase all their tickets and go to their concerts even though neither of these people are born again christians i don't believe they are for a second and we're going to see more why about amy grant as we keep going but she was asked what are your and because this is an interview they told everybody okay write a question on the back of, of these papers they handed them or whatever and they said ask here are questions that you want to ask michael w smith and amy grant on stage now, the pathetic part is that most of <laughs> most interviewers and most fanboys and fangirls that write down these questions, they, they ask them questions that you could look up and find the answer on Wikipedia if you wanted to. Why are you asking them these questions? They never ask them the pointed questions, things that I want to hear, like, why don't you tell us how you were saved? They never, they never ask those questions, and the reason they don't is because most of the, most, a lot of their fans are probably false converts themselves. They don't really care how they were saved, because they say they're Christians, so obviously we're all Christians because we say so. <laughs> it has nothing to do about the evidence of the matter. 
And so she was asked, what, what were your musical influences growing up and what are they still today? Here was her answer. Quote, I'm the youngest of four girls, so I got to borrow uh, all of my older sister's records. I really cut my teeth on Joni Mitchell, Judy Collins, James Taylor, Aretha Franklin, Elton John. Of course, we had a lot of Elvis, a lot of Beatles, Three Dog Night, Jethro Tull. All that was in the house, end quote. I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. Because, I mean, I could tell you, well, first of all, I would encourage people, if you don't know a lot about some of the wickedness of some of these rock bands and things like that, go to uh, type in the word rock or type in the word music is probably better into the search bar at creationlibrary.com. Read an article called What's Wrong with Christian Rock and check out some of the origins of this stuff. I mean, we talk, we go over a lot of the Satanist Aleister Crowley, how he had a ton of influence into what is known as rock music today. And Elvis, like, take for example, she said, we had a lot of Elvis in the house. That was one of her influences. And apparently they asked her what's her influence then and now. She says Elvis Presley. And that is true because one of her Christmas albums she did, she, she got a recording of Elvis Presley and she sang backup with it to this Elvis and Amy sing these wicked Christmas songs in, in honor of the, the pagan sun god and all the Catholics worship, right? And so that is that's definitely one of her influences still today. Well, Elvis Presley, I need to do an entire expose on this guy in the future because a lot of people don't understand. Now, they, he's almost worshipped as a god today. And people said, oh, Elvis never died. Yes, he did. He died, bloated with his pants around his ankles, on a toilet in the middle of the night, and in his hand, as far as I understand, in his hand was a book that he used to carry around with him everywhere. This book was a book by by the name of a lady named uh, Madame Blavowski. Who is Madame Blavowski? This is a Satanist Aleister Crowley's number two partner that helped him, and the two of them together brought Satanism into the 20th century. And Elvis was learning continually from her philosophies. This guy was an adulterous fornicator like you wouldn't believe, one of the worst in this country ever. I mean, like next to Bill Clinton, kind of bad, okay? Elvis Presley was as wicked as could possibly be and this is her influence she creates music with this guy and so i mean even i mean she talks about oh the beatles were their influence well the beatles considered satanist aleister crowley to be one of their heroic icons they put his picture on the front of one of their albums and michael w smith gave very similar answers after amy grant which should be no surprise to you guys after we did the entire teaching about him which you can go look up by typing in michael w smith uh, or just Michael Smith, or just even Smith. You can probably just type that in at creationliberty.com. You'll find the article. So you have young musicians in the crowd who are thinking, man, I really want to become a Christian, in quotation, music artist. I really want to become that. How could I become like Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant? Oh, look at their influences. Look at their inspirations. They were all these wicked artists. I better go start listening to them myself. And some of you are thinking, people don't actually do that. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. There is not one word from Michael W. Smith or Amy L. Grant, her middle name's Lee, um, not one mention of any of the wickedness of these men or rebuking or saying, you know, when I grew up, I was listening to these people, but, you know, these guys are really wicked. I wouldn't touch them anymore. I wouldn't listen to them anymore because they're not really Christians. They're teaching the things that they teach in their songs are really bad for us to listen to and we shouldn't do it. Not one word about any of that. They just say it as if, oh, these are okay to listen to, guys. Go out and buy all their CDs, too. And Matthew 16, 12 says, Then they understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Folks, you've got to beware of their doctrine. And musicians teach doctrine in the words of their music, whether you want to believe it or not. People say, oh, but, you know, listen, I've, I've heard some of the most ridiculous songs sung. The words make absolutely no sense whatsoever, but when they're sung with a beautiful or upbeat melody, everybody seems to, it's almost like, oh wow, this makes so much sense and this really reaches out to me. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but you see they're, they're deceiving you with the tune. They're deceiving you with the melody. 
And in Acts 17.11, and you guys are very familiar with this, this is why we call our, our Bible study group, Bereans Online, is because these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Folks, you don't just do that with preachers. You should do that with your musicians, too. If you have a musician that you love to listen to so much, go into the Word of God and just turn off all their, all their music, all their melodies, and simply read the words. And that's what we're going to do today, again, with Amy Grant. We've done this with lots of different artists. We're going to do it with Amy Grant. So again, before we begin, let's read some of Psalm 66 to get a structure on, on what is supposed to be praise and worship to God. Because, again, Psalm 66, one is one of those things that all these Christian rockers out there who are totally, I mean, you can't even have a conversation with these people most of the time. I mean, I had a guy recently come on there, was emailing us one time, telling us how much he loved our ministry until he found our rebuke on a lot of these New Age artists like this. And he's, I mean, I mean, Tim was talking with one of them, too. I mean, we, we talked to the guy together. The guy absolutely said, I am not listening to anything he has in these teachings. He said, Chris, I want you to answer this question, this question, this question for me. I even pointed out, I said, okay, in this particular, we have four parts. In part three, we answer that. He says, I won't listen to it. I want you to give me an answer. I said, I did provide the answer, but you're not willing to listen. <laughs> what, what do you want me to do here? And then I said, I'll tell you what, we can hop onto Skype and we can chat about it. I usually don't offer that to everybody, but this guy, you know, I, for some reason I was convicted. I said, okay, let me offer and see if he'll talk on Skype. And he says, until you answer my questions, I'm not going to talk with you on Skype. How does that make sense? To talk with me on Skype, I'll answer your questions. But you see, the point was he doesn't really want an answer. They don't want an answer. They want to justify themselves. And to have to sit and have a talk with me about it, would be, they don't want to hear what the Word of God has to say about this stuff. And to point out a lot of the fall, fallacious things that they're saying. So they read Psalm 66, one. They say, make a joyful noise unto God. Okay, bang drums. All right, yay, we're making joyful noises. Okay, God didn't say, be babies. It says, make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands, and continue reading, because it has a colon at the end of that, all ye lands, colon. That means, what, when he's doing that, he's saying, what do I mean by this? What's making a joyful noise? Here we go. It says, sing forth the honor of his name, make his praise glorious, say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thy enemies submit themselves unto thee. Say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thy enemies submit themselves unto thee. He turned the sea into dry land. He went through, they went through the flood on foot. There did we rejoice in him. He ruleth by his power forever. His eyes behold the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Sila, which means stop and think. Yes, stop and think about these things. Continue on your own. You guys can read Psalm 66 on your own time, okay? But if you continue to read through the whole chapter, it's going to give very, very specific things, pointing out the specific works of God. And all these things, you're not going to see in any of this modern, you know, CCM, all these CCM obsessors and these Christian rockers, you're not going to see hardly any of this, okay? Every now and again, you might find something here or there, but often when I find something in it, I find out that the artist who sang it didn't write it, number one. It's somebody else who wrote it. They're just singing it. That's it. But they themselves don't believe it. So there's problem after problem with this stuff. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing to you a song that many of you are probably familiar with from Amy Grant. I'm not going to I just said sing it to you. I'm not going to sing it to you. I'm going to read it to you, okay? This is a song called... All I Ever Have to Be. And i got to say, Amy Grant sings this beautifully. She's got a beautiful voice. But don't be deceived, folks, by the pretty voice. All right. Let's read this, and I want you guys to tell me. I'm going to read it, and then afterwards, you guys give me your analysis of your thoughts on this, or what you may think is, is missing from this after we've just read Psalm 66. Okay. She says, When the weight of all my dreams is resting heavy on my head, and the thoughtful words of health and hope have, have all been nicely said, but I'm still hurting, wondering if I'll ever be the one I think I am. Then you gently remind me that you've made me from the first, and the more I try to be the best, the more I get the worst, and I realize the good in me is only there because of who you are, and all I ever have to be is what you've made me, any more or less would be a step out of your plan." As you daily re recreate me, help me always keep in mind that I only have to do what I can find. And all I ever have to be 
All I ever have to be is what you've made me. Okay, so you guys tell me... Anybody, tell me your thoughts about what we just read. Who's the you she's talking about? Good question. I can't answer that for you. I don't know who she's talking about. I mean, because of course, didn't we just say, uh, make his name, uh, make his, or excuse me, sing forth the honor of his name? Isn't that in Psalm 66 too? Well, where's his name? She, she's not mentioning God's name anywhere. Yeah. Or even, even referring back to anything to where you could even remotely say this is pointing towards the Christian God of the Bible? That's a good point. Anybody else? Well, she keeps saying, um, all, and all I ever have to be is what you've made me. But what the Bible says in Matthew 8, verse 34, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said un, unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself mm -hmm. and take up his cross and follow me. Yeah. That's an excellent point. Excellent. Because here it is, is like, all I ever have to be is what you've made me. And now, but it's almost like, okay, well, I was born. What I would, even though we are born to sin, she thinks us being born to sin, oh, well, God made us this way. He made us with all this sin, so it's okay. And, and here, I'll, I'll add one more. When she says, if I were to do any more or less than that sinful person that she was born as, she says, that's a step out of your plan. Whoa, whoa. In Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 21, it says, If so be that ye have heard of him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man which is after God, after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Well, okay, I, I just, was there, I mean, you guys tell me, was there anything about the gospel of Jesus Christ in this song that you could find? Not at all. I, I'm not saying it either. Okay, I, I like it when other, I'm glad that you guys are giving me this because a lot of people just accuse me, Chris, you're just saying these things. No, it's not. Other people who study the word can also see these things. If you take the time to study instead of listening to your music the whole time, and so now let me read a gospel-centered song. Let's hear the other side of this. This is a song called Take My Life and Let It Be. It says, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for, for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and gold, and not a mite would I withhold. Remember how the Bible always talks about that, you know, that it's the pagans and the heathen that, have, that look after silver and gold. It says, Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall no longer be mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it is thy royal throne. Take my love, my lord, I pour it at thy, thy feet, its treasure store. Take myself, I will, ever, I will be ever only all for thee. Now, that also did not mention the name of the Lord Jesus Christ specifically, but it is complete submission in one, the reason I'm comparing these is that in one, you've got where, well, I just have to be what I am, where in the other, where it's more gospel-centered, you've got where it's, it's take everything that I am and reshape it, make it to what you are. And that's why I put this on here to compare the two. Now, people are arguing and say, well, you know, that's not, not mentioning the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I agree with that, okay? But in this, it's complete opposite attitude is what I'm trying to show here. And again, Proverbs 19.27 says, Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causes it to err from the words of knowledge. If you have a song that is causing you to err from the knowledge of the word of God, my Bible says, cease to hear that instruction. That means quit listening to that music because it's only going to corrupt you. Because again, when you're just like we talked about in the King James teaching, that which you're listening to, that which you're taking into yourself, you're being educated continually. I mean, people think, oh, well, that stops when I'm a child. That never stops. Your brain is always continually taking things in. And whatever you're listening to, primarily, that's going to be primarily what your knowledge base is in. 
whether you study the Word of God or whether you listen to New Age rock music. And the New Age music, the rock music, the CCM, all that, the people I see who listen to that most of the time, that's what they spend most of their time doing, you can see all sorts of false doctrines come out of their mouth. And those are the people who are most offended when I will bring out an article that's rebuking someone or that's trying to teach the truth about a matter or teach the truth about judgment or, or anything like that, right? Those are the people that get most offended because they have spent most of their life listening to false doctrine through this music. When my Bible says to quit listening to it. In 1 Corinthians 6.18 it says flee fornication. Well, that's not what Amy Grant's teaching. It says, flee fornication. Why? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. But Amy Grant is using her body for her own self-glory, not to glorify God. It's for filthy lucre is why she's using that. And in Titus chapter 1, it says, for there are many rulers, un, excuse me, for many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they have circumcision. He says, why? Especially who? The people who are supposed to appear to be godly on the outside. He says, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And that's exactly what Amy Grant's doing here. She's teaching things which she ought not be teaching for the sake of the money involved. That's what lucre is. It's money. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, it says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. You're going to find, as we go keep going through this, Amy Grant is not encouraging people to fight the good fight of faith. Okay, And some of these things she might, you know, when they said, oh, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path, Amy Grant might sing that, but that doesn't mean she believes it. Okay, Just like Billy Graham, he might, every now and again, like I've heard some of his old sermons sounded really good, but that doesn't mean he believes that same thing. Because he's never taught, he, he might say, oh, well, you know, it's Jesus Christ by the cross alone that you can come to heaven. But he has made all sorts of other statements about that. Completely opposite statements over the past 50 years. So just because he might have taught it at one time does not mean he has ever believed that, okay? Again, the Bible tells us that there's going to be, I mean, Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. Therefore, don't marvel that there's going to be, his ministers are going to be transformed into ministers of righteousness to look like they're doing what's right. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says, For we are his workmanship created in Jesus Christ unto good works, which God hath ordained, that hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Before you were ever born, he ordained that you should walk in the good works of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Amy Grant's like, no, 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 just, you know, just do what you are, just... You know, I only have to do what I can find. And then, and, you know, whatever they can find is typically only as far as they're ever willing to read. Because, you know, you have these people, like I've talked about multiple instances just in our first and second half alone today, of examples of people that refuse to even look at what we're teaching here. They won't listen to it. They won't read any of it. But then thinking, I only have to do what I can find. I'm only responsible for what I can find. Yeah, and you, you're willfully ignorant to these things. So it's no wonder you can't find anything. And then they think God's not going to hold them accountable to this stuff. He is. So it takes study, discernment, discipline to do the good works of God. Not just, you know, listening to a fun time, happy music that gives you a good, warm, gooey feeling inside. All right? I'm not saying that we can't ever feel good in our hearts. But what I'm saying is that they are basing... A lot of these people, not just Amy Grant, but the people who listen to her, most of them are basing their so-called Christianity on their feelings, the foundation of how they feel. And we'll see more of Amy Grant mention that stuff uh, in the future. So what version does Amy Grant read? Well, in this uh, interview with BeliefNet that she had, the reporter asked, what's one of your favorite Bible verses? And she says, quote, well, I'll just tell you one that I read this morning, Galatians 5, the back half of, of verse 6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And I thought, the only thing that counts? End quote. So, you know, she's trying to say, oh, well, this is the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Well, first of all, she hasn't defined faith, and she hasn't defined love either. But then I thought, well, let me go look and see what Bible version she's using. Well, she's using it from an NIV, which we have gone over of the amazing amounts of corruption in the NIV. It's unbelievably wicked, some of the stuff that it teaches. But this is what she reads on a, on a regular basis. So it's no wonder she's teaching so much false doctrine. I mean, she's got so much false doctrine in the book that she's, she's studying from. So now we can read that in... 
the King James Bible in Galatians 5.6, it says, for, Jesus, for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which, which worketh by love. Now, it does not say that faith expressing itself through love is the only thing that counts. The context is extremely important here. Paul is explaining to Galatia that it's folly to put emphasis on whether or not someone should be circumcised because that type of thinking leads us back into the bondage of the law and the faith which worketh by love is what matters in Christ Jesus. Okay, We have to make sure that's specifically emphasized. Paul continues, and he goes on after this, to explain that we should obey the truth of the word of God, not running around teaching a bunch of false doctrine and using sex in our bodies to sell it, okay? And that when they do not obey the truth, it's called leaven. And Galatians 5, chapter 5, starting verse 7, says, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So you've got leaven that she's teaching, She's teaching in interviews, leaven that she's teaching in her music, but people keep bringing it into themselves. Well, guess what? A little leaven. Leaveneth what? The entire lump, okay? Not just a little bit. And they think, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to put, well, but she's got this other music here. Maybe we'll just add that in and, and, and we'll switch around. Maybe we won't play this one song she has and we'll play these other songs she has. Okay, folks, this is like having an entire barrel of rotten, stinking apples that are rotten to the core and then... The farmer thinking, hmm, you know what I need to do? Let's put in 20 more good apples, and that'll fix the entire thing. That's, that's ridiculous. That's one of the most nonsensical things I have ever heard of, and anybody's ever heard of. That doesn't work. But when it concerns the church, that's exactly what they'll do. And like I said, a lot of them are false converts that have no discernment, no understanding of the truth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting verse 13, it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. You see, they're going to look like they're, te they're, they're Christians that are teaching the truth of the word. And no marvel. That means don't be surprised. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers are also transformed as the, the ministers of righteousness, who in shall be according to their works. They will appear to be very kind, very gentle, warm people. They'll appear to be very, very caring in every way to be a sheep. But our Lord God has been gracious enough to provide for us, preserve his word for us. And folks, that's why in Psalm chapter 12, he said he was going to preserve his word for the protection of the poor and the needy. The people who were going to be deceived by people like this. To prevent them from being deceived by people who would lead them astray with good words and fair speeches. That's why he preserved his word for us. And so many people do not take advantage of the fact that God pre preserved his word for us, and so to study it and to, and to be on guard against that. Again, we're supposed to, in John chapter 7, verse 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Do not judge Amy Grant by her voice and her looks. You judge it by the doctrine she's teaching. Do not be deceived by a pretty smile, or you're going to be led astray. Amy Grant can't see these things clearly because she doesn't have a fear of the Lord. And we talked about that in our first half, about the fear of the Lord being the foundation for what we need for the wisdom and understanding. Because in Psalm uh, 111.10, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. All these people that won't even listen to any of this to find out what the truth is, it's the fool. They despise wisdom and instruction. They don't want that. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 13, says, Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. That's why we have to be careful what comes off the tongue. The poison of asps is under their lips. And later it says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. They don't have, the people that do this stuff and teach these faults, they don't have any fear of God. They have none whatsoever. I've never heard Amy Grant ever sing about the fear of the Lord. I could be wrong about that, but I've, I, you know, that I'm not saying she never have. I have never heard her do it. And in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 30, it says, Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. You want to do what's right, women? Fear the Lord, first and foremost. Now, this is a, this is a song that Amy Grant just released this past year. And uh, we're going to... You know, for her being such a Christian artist, let's go ahead and I'm going to read this one and then you guys give me your thoughts after it, okay? It says, it's called, um, actually, I put the wrong, I have a typo in there. Um, I actually forget this one, what this one's called. 
but I'll have to. I, I think it's called "Welcome Yourself." I think is what the song is called, and I, I accidentally uh, did a typo there, so I'll have to fix that. But it says, "You give so much, juggle it all with a smile. You tame the tornadoes with style. How do you keep it all up?" Now I, I'll tell you before I continue this is that this was she's she's making this song for like a, a, a cancer event or something. She wrote this song for they're singing for cancer or something. And we'll have to do a whole teaching on the cancer issue later. I think that'll be important. But anyway, continuing here, she says, How do you keep it all up? I guess because every day comes to an end, you get up and do it again. No matter whatever gets done, welcome yourself to the messy moment. Welcome yourself to be here now. Open your arms, open your heart. When some of that love comes back around, ready to run when you feel the storm, learning to try, learning to fly, learning to fall, welcome yourself to it all. Now it's you stuck in the wake of these words so many others have heard, wondering how you get through. You just let go into the music that plays. Dance with the songs as they change. That's how you'll know what to do. Anybody want to talk about your thoughts over this? She just seems to be saying, you know, she's not saying go to God to anything. She's she's saying telling these people to go to themselves. Yeah, it seems really really self centered. Yeah. Anybody else? Sounds like to me she's putting utter confusion out there. Well, really, I uh, I don't know if this correlates, but it sounds like it's it's uh, going into a trance, like what you were saying about listening to the music and letting the music take control. That's what it sounds like you're going into a trance or something like that. And then, really, that's not that's not the spirit of God. That's just, uh, I don't even know what, what you would call that. I, I don't think it's demonic possession, but... Well, I mean, yeah, and all this is, the confusion that you're talking about and the, uh, what Daedric was just saying and, and what uh, Jeannie was just saying, all of that correlates back to this self-centeredness because you give so much you is not talking about the lord god that's not the focus of the song she actually said i think another place i wrote she wrote the song like because of her mother or something and so really this is a praise song to women in general you do this, you tame the tornadoes, you get up, just welcome yourself. It's all about you, okay? You feeling good about everything. And then at the end of the song, how do you get guidance? Somebody tell me, according to this song at the end, how do you get guidance on what you're supposed to do in your life when you're going through hardship? I guess uh, dance with the songs as they change. That's how you know what to do. That's pretty much yoke up with the world. <laughs> Listen to music and dance, and that is how... He's absolutely right, what Tim just said. That's exactly what I got from this song. The end lesson to this song is you just go with your feeling and dance around and, and listen to music, and then you'll know what to do. Well, then that's... I My Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. You start following your heart, Satan's going to grab a hold on you, and he's going to guide you to places you're not supposed to go. Why don't we listen to a gospel-centered song when when things are when you have things that are in trouble and what you're supposed to do? Okay, let's see what what the gospel-centered. This this song is called "Near My God to Thee." It says, "Near my God to Thee, near to Thee, even though it be a cross that raiseth me, still all my song shall be near my God to Thee." Though like a like the wanderer, the sun gone down, darkness be over me, my my rest a stone. See, this is this is also describing a. A state of desperation, like it's like Amy Grant was trying to provide. It says, "Yet in my dreams, I'd be near my God to Thee. Let there let the way appear, steps unto heaven. All that that Thou sendest me in mercy given, angels to beckon me near my God to Thee. Or if on joyful wing cleaving the sky, sun, moon, and stars forgot, upward I'll fly." Wait a second, that's interesting. When the sun, moon, and stars go dark, that's when we're going to be gathered unto Christ? Hmm. How interesting. <laughs> Post-trib doctrine, folks. This pre-trib doctrine is a, is a New Age Catholic Jesuit false prophecy. Okay, the people are, are repeating. And this was not taught. Up, it has only been recently this has ever been taught, like in the past 150 years. 
And they're in, anyway, you have to go back. If, if anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about with that, go back and look up our teaching on tribulation and rapture, our beginner's guide on that. But it says, sun, moon, and stars forgot, and, and stars forgot, upward I'll fly. Still all my songs shall be nearer my God to thee. There in my father's home, safe and at rest. There in my Savior's love, perfectly blessed, age after age to be nearer my God to thee. So here in one part, Amy Drant just says, listen to music and jump around, do whatever you feel. And the Gospel Center song says, draw near unto God. Let every, you know. Let your voice be heard about Him, and and your your thoughts and everything focused on the on the Savior. That's what all this is is focusing on, and focusing on where we're going, not where we are. Where we are going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in the place where you know in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. He said, "This is where we're headed." So. If my permanent home is going to be there, that is what I want to invest into. And that's what this Near My God to Thee is focusing on, is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord God. Where Amy Grant's song has nothing to do with any of that. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come unto me, all, that, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You want rest from all these things? You don't start self focusing on yourself. Because Second Timothy chapter three says, "This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away." We're supposed to turn away from those that are trying to focus ourselves in false doctrine of being lovers of ourselves. We ought to, just like the uh, the song we had covered when I did the Christian rock stuff that says, "Love thyself last." Make yourself the person that is last, and love others first. Love the Lord Jesus Christ. First and foremost, above all, love others before yourself. That's the way it's supposed to do it. But the world is teaching the exact opposite. And the people will, will object to all this. They'll get so upset about the, you know, the Amy Grant fans and say, yeah, but she sang a song called El Shaddai, and that has a lot of gospel in it. That's true, but Amy Grant did not write that song. And by the way, she allowed some words to be changed. I'm sure her management told her, do not sing the original words to the song, which says, though the Jews couldn't see, she changed it, the, the words of the song to the people couldn't see because her and her producers knew she wouldn't make as much money if she offended anybody with her music. But the fact that it's the Jews couldn't see, that's part of the gospel right there. The fact that it went from the Jew to the Gentile, that's part of it. But that part she wants to remove because she doesn't want her music to offend anyone. Why? Because she doesn't really want it to teach the gospel in the end. Okay? She's singing what's popular amongst a lot of people. Michael W. Smith wrote a lot of her songs. and But the songs that she has written, I mean, I don't want to go through too many of these because, like I said, I want to finish this today. And if I keep going through all these, I we're, it's, it's going to take up too much time. But you can read some of these on your own. Um, well, I guess I'll read this one real quick. I just won't ask for, for everybody's thoughts on it. I'm just going to go through this because I, I really want to get through this this week, okay? I might go over a little bit, but I'm sorry about that. But this song is, is from A.B. Grant called How Mercy Looks From Here. It says, The water rose today, the river with the rain, memories and picture frames are floating miles away. Through the wreckage and the mud, the ruins after the flood, she survived at 91. Mm. Some would have given up, drowning in their tears, but on her wrinkled face, a smile appears when you face your greatest fear, losing all that you hold dear. Open up your eyes, my dear. Oh, how mercy looks from here. I would have given up drowning in my tears if it wasn't for your voice all these years. That's when boundless grace appears. Unseen angels hover near. Saints are singing loud and clear. Oh, how mercy looks from here. Well, my question is, where's the Lord Jesus Christ? Where is the blood of the Son of God, his finished work on the cross, his power, his kingdom, his saving grace? Uh, I, I don't, I'm not really seeing it in this, in this song. Okay. It's just, you know, it's talking, it's really more self-focused. A lot of this music, it, it's extremely vague on purpose because they, they want it to be interpreted how, how anybody wants to interpret it. And Amy Grant's going to state that later as I get to that. Another example is in 2005, in order to boost sales for, from her Christian audience, you know, after her divorce and remarriage and all that, which a lot of people were upset with, and we'll talk about that later, she put out an album called Rock of Ages, Hymns and Faith, which contains 13 songs, but only one of them was written by Amy Grant. It's a song called Carry You, which tells the listener to call upon my name, but never specifically mentions what name they're supposed to call upon. It never talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then and on top of that, to get foolish churchgoers to spend more money buying her album, she wants to, you know, lure them in with this sexy image that she has. It doesn't bother her one bit, okay? Because her music is there to entertain, not to teach the truth. And you can see that level of, of carnal entertainment she's trying to provide because of the amount of worldly awards she's received from all sorts of wicked sources. The Grammys, MTV, places like this have given her tons of awards. Well, my Bible says in Luke 16, 15, he says, That which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And Amy Grant is definitely highly esteemed among men. So, in, in I quoted 1 Timothy 2, 9 earlier, which, taught, which commands women to be sober, all right? With shamefacedness and sobriety, it said. But Amy Grant doesn't care for that at all. She gets excited when her audience is smoking marijuana. She said, quote, I remember years ago, the first time I smelled somebody smoking a joint at a concert, I was thrilled. I thought, this is incredible. A lot of people smoke like smokestacks, but if they're in a gathering they know is all Christians, they will not totally be themselves, end quote. So she's like, oh, it's so great that they can be themselves and just, you know, do all the drugs they want to in the audience of the concert that she's doing. I mean, these people calling themselves Christians just doing whatever they feel like doing, whether it's biblical or not. Before she divorced her Gary Chapman, which was her first husband, he said, quote, I think she wants to say that it's okay to be a Christian and have fun, not to completely separate yourself from humanity just because you don't believe exactly like everyone else, end quote. Now, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ has nothing to do with what men think and what, believe, what they believe. It has to do with what's right by the word of God, and the word of God tells us to sanctify ourselves, set ourselves apart from the world. In Ephesians 5.11, it says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. But Amy Grant yokes herself up to the world. She's been invited, George H.W. Bush, you know, from back in the 80s, she's been invited to their George and Barbara Bush's 50th anniversary stuff to, to sing songs, and she's participated in all this stuff. She's been jo invited with, you know, her now husband, Vince Gill, George W. Bush, into to his get-togethers, his parties to, to perform before he speaks and introducing him. A lot of the stuff, you can read some of the quotations here. I'm not going to go over some of this. You'll have to go in the article. You can read more about this, but... She yokes herself up with, with all sorts of wicked people. At the, the Yamaha 20, 125th anniversary concert, which was streamed online for free for people to watch, this the article that was reporting on this from Yamaha said, quote, Joining the Rocket Man Elton John on stage will be Amy Grant, along with, and, and here's some others, uh, Shaka Khan, Dave Grusin, Earth, Wind & Fire, David Foster, Dave Cause, James Newton Howard, Leah Gunn, Landon Pig, Lucy Schwartz, uh, Michael McDonald from the Doobie Brothers, Sarah McLaughlin, who does a whole bunch of, she's, I mean, basically her entire following is a bunch of lesbians, Sinbad and Toto, end quote. So a lot of these people you can go look up and see all the wickedness that she is associating herself with. Folks, I mean, that 125th anniversary, that was in 2013. So don't think that, well, that was a long time ago and she's changed. No, she hasn't. She's never changed. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved and blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ bled and died so that we would be sanctified. Hebrews 13.12 says, Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. The suffering he went through was so that we would be sanctified. But people won't do it. Okay, because they follow after examples like Amy Grant. They follow people like her who are doing wickedness in the sight of God, and she does, she could care less. That's why, I mean, Amy Grant is often considered a lot more worldly than even Michael W. Smith is. Because Michael W. Smith doesn't get on stage with people like this, like Amy Grant will. But Michael W. Smith still yokes him up with a bunch of wicked people, so don't... You know, I don't want you to get the wrong idea there. Uh, it's just that's why Amy Grant is often considered a little bit more worldly than Michael W. Smith is. But they're both, you know, in, they're both in the same boat. They're no different. That's why they yoke themselves up together and go around and tour together. But Amy Grant said, and by the way, some of these quotes are in a, in a book called Amy Grant, The Life of a Pop Star. And by the way, the author of this book is, he's not writing this exposing Amy Grant. He's writing it trying to justify her and got all these quotations out. And... She said, quote, why isolate, why isolate yourself? Your life isolates you enough. I'm isolated when I walk into a room and somebody says, she's a Christian and nobody offers me a joint and all the cocaine disappears. I don't want it anyway, but it doesn't mean that we can't be friends, end quote. 
So she's like, no, no, you don't need to put away your cocaine. You don't need to stop doing all your wickedness. I'll hang with you. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And what what they're trying to talk about and isolate yourselves, they'll also you know the 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 churchianity folks and the mainstream pastors often quote from Hebrews ten twenty five. It says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Now notice in context, we don't nothing it says about isolating ourselves here, but it doesn't say that we assemble ourselves together with the world. We assemble ourselves together with brethren in Christ. Not to go hang out people while they're snorting cocaine. All right, in the same manner, to try to get this point across, I guess, a little more clearly. Um, I want you guys to imagine, you you go into a building with some people, okay? You think you're going to go to a social and, and meet some people. And when you walk behind this curtain, you've got a bunch of couches set up in a circle. And there's a bunch of people having a sex orgy. Would you go sit down on one of these couches and chat with someone about Jesus Christ at that point? Or would you walk out of the room? Because, uh, you see, my Lord Jesus Christ in John 17, all right, he, and starting in verse 15, it says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. He didn't pray that we were taken out of the world or that we couldn't talk with anyone, but we're not going to participate in what they're doing. We're going to sanctify ourselves from that stuff. The Bible says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Jesus Christ set himself apart from those wicked actions for the fact that we ought to also set ourselves apart from those wicked actions. And Luke 6.22, if, you know, well, what will they say? Will they not like me? Will they not be my friend? Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, when they shall separate you from their company for the Son of Man's sake. Not when they separate you from their company because you have wrought wickedness or because you have been cruel to someone or you've been rude to them or anything like that. It's when they are departing from you because you make them feel uncomfortable. When they depart from you, blessed are you. But that's not what Amy Grant believes. She doesn't believe what the Bible teaches on that stuff. She thinks they're supposed to be hanging out with people in their worldly sin. Again, if you want to see more about the sanctification, I encourage people to go and just type in the word division at creationliberty.com in the search bar, and you'll see an article called Did Christ Come to Bring Peace? Read that and get some more information on that. We did, we did I think, like a two-part teaching over at audio you can listen to as well. So, in, again, at, in the end times, people were going to be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a formerly godliness but denying the power thereof, and from such turn away. Okay, They love their pleasures more. And if, I'm telling you, if the relationships in your life are more important to you than the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amy Grant, in this was from her About page, because what I'm going to quote you, I, I started seeing some stuff on her About page, because I went online trying to hunt down some sort of salvation testimony this woman has. I can't find it anywhere. Okay, I can't find anything about her. People ask about, what's your religious background? She'll say, oh, I went to church. I grew up doing a church. And that's about all she says. She won't say anything else. I think she thinks she was born into Christianity. That's, that's the impression I've gotten from her so far after doing weeks and weeks of research, looking up and, and reading so many interviews that were just simply a waste of my time uh, because these interviewers were not asked her any pointed questions. On the website, it says, quote, At some point in, in life, you realize that some things really matter and some things don't. Living matters. Celebrating life matters. End quote. Okay, I'm cutting some of these short because I really want to get through this today. I, I don't want to continue on with her next week. But she says, you know, these things matter. The, the, it's all about the living and all about the life. Well, remember Tim was quoting the scripture earlier. It says, I thought you were supposed to deny yourself. What about Matthew 10:39? It says, he that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Okay? And that's, I mean, that is what we're supposed to be focusing on is the life to come not this life but she's she's focusing on all oh, on the relationships and the people and you got to have all this stuff you know and and living your life is what she's focusing it on anytime she talks about faith faith in what she's never clear about what she's talking about when it comes to faith all right there's a lot of people out there 
folks who have uh, wicked people uh, like R. Kelly and Michelle Williams and Kelly Price and a bunch of these other wicked mu- so-called music artists, okay, depending on what you want to call music, but all these people who have Try, what they'll do is every now and again they'll try to pick up a gospel song and sing it to try to make some extra money, thinking, oh, okay, well, you know, these Christians will like that if we sing this gospel song. But they themselves, all they're trying to do is just make money off of it. That's it. They don't believe what they're singing. But Amy Grant, she's been singing her music for Jesus. It doesn't matter whether she mentions it or not. It's all about Jesus, and she'll say so. Well, let's, let's look at an, an interview she did with Billboard magazine and see what she says. Quote, I make music because I'm what I'm driven to do is connect. I'm sorry, did she say she makes music because of the Lord Jesus Christ? No. I make music because what I'm driven to do is connect. There were times I would get to the end of something and say, Whoa, whoo, I feel better, but not exactly be sure of what I meant by the lyric. The, occur- the reoccurring theme is longing and I think that's because I have some very intense, unresolved issues in my life. Look, I'm not the consummate, skilled musician. I am not the deep thinker. I just love music, and it has truly been a lifeline for me." End quote. I'm sorry, did, did Amy Grant say that the Lord Jesus Christ was her lifeline? And that she loves the Lord Jesus Christ? No. She loves her music, and their music has been her lifeline. It is her guiding light, folks. Thy word, she sings about, is not a lamp unto her feet. She just sings that. And this is an image of her, by the way, on the website, of her getting a her secular reward on Hollywood's Walk of Fame. If you're getting a star, which, by the way, I mean, the whole concept of Hollywood is witchcraft. Hollywood is, is talking about holly, the holly tree, which we point out the specific significance of that in witchcraft in our Christmas article, if you just type in the word Christmas at creationliberty.com, go look that up and read through that. And it talks about how it'll, we demonstrate that holly is very significant. They would make witches' wands out of holly to put people under a spell, to put them in a trance. And the you remember they, they always talk about movie magic? That's why. It's all based in witchcraft. The, entire, the, the, the Hollywood star is the pentagram. That's the symbol for that, for, for the, the witch's pentagram, okay? And if you get a pentagram on a sidewalk in Hollywood, you are being backed by Satan fully. I mean, there's really no argument about that. You can't get that far. You think they'd ever give someone like me something like that? I mean, I reject it anyway, but you think they'd ever do that? No way. You have to be d- dipped into secular carnal, fleshly life in order to get something like that. And by the way, the entire interview with Billboard I was pointing out here has no mention of the Christian God of the Bible in it whatsoever. In this art, the same article in Billboard magazine, it says, quote, Now, at least for the time being, Grant remains satisfied to continue her search for answers using her music as a tool to lead the way. I'm sorry, did he say that Grant was using her music to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? No. Is she looking for truth in in the word of God? No. Grant remains satisfied to continue her search for answers using her music as a tool to lead the way. Her music becomes the foundation, the final authority for all matters in faith and practice. It continues and says, There's no end to what this songwriting is dredging up for me, she says. Every song has some seed of reality, somewhere between what life is and what you wish it were. I'm always on the endless hunt to be moved, end quote. Did she say she was on the endless hunt for truth? The endless hunt to please the Lord Jesus Christ? No, she's on the endless hunt to be moved, to have her emotions swayed. Her emotional state is the foundation for everything she does, folks. I didn't say that. Amy Grant is saying that. So don't write me these emails saying, you're saying this and you're saying this, but you're wrong, Chris, and I don't like you, and blah, blah, blah. I didn't say it. You go read what Amy Grant says. You contact her office and ask them what she meant by these things. And, hey, I have to say, you know, I know it's the devil's luck, but good luck with that because I have contacted Amy Grant's official website. I've tried to contact them. I simply wrote them a letter, and I said, I didn't tell them anything about who I was. I just said, look, I, I was looking through the website, and I didn't see much about salvation. I was wondering how to get saved. Could you tell me? I've never heard back from them. Never heard back from them. They don't care, folks. It's not about the Lord Jesus Christ to them. It's about how much money they make. 
she doesn't care what what impression anyone gets from her music so long they just interpret it themselves. That's what she's talking about. I mentioned that briefly earlier. She said, quote, this is from, again, the, the book Amy Grant, The Life of a Pop Star, quote, that's one reason I started writing songs because I didn't want to impose my religion on anyone. Folks, she doesn't want to teach Christian doctrine to anybody. She continues and says, this way my audience can sit back and draw their own conclusions. And I feel a certain freedom because I've communicated what I think and the audience's interpretation of it is its own responsibility, end quote. So why do you think she stays so vague? So that the audience can interpret it any way they want. So everybody can love Avian Grant. Everybody can love her music. It doesn't matter what false heretical doctrine that she wants to teach. She may mention the name of Jesus in her songs, but even when she does, the Jesus that she's referring to is a Jesus, in lowercase j, Jesus, in quotations, she believes in, that, that is okay with fornication and adultery and anyone else's worldly false religion. Because, after all, like the New Age teaching is everybody's going to heaven, right? There is no hell. Catholics, for example, love Amy Grant. There's not enough in her music to really rebuke them either, okay? Uh, Catholic.org reported, quote, When telling friends I was going to interview Amy Grant, most of them said, I love Amy Grant. My family listened to her music on road trips. Or, Heart in Motion was my favorite album as a kid. I sang her songs all the time, end quote. And, of course, in, in this uh, Catholic Online article that they did, they said, quote, The more Amy spoke, the more I realized the purpose and inspiration behind her music was what? Now listen to this. What did he realize the purpose behind her music was? Was it the Lord Jesus Christ? Was it the teaching of the truth of God's word? No. The purpose and inspiration behind her music? Experience. Her trying experience not only serve as the inspiration behind her songs, but they are the reason as well, end quote. It is Amy Grant's personal feelings and sways of emotions she's gone through through the experiences of her life is the entire purpose behind her music. Not only is Amy Grant stating this, but other people are seeing as well. Other, other worldly people that are not even born again are seeing the same thing. So Christians, my question to you, why can't you see it? Is it because you went into a Christian bookstore and because there's, a, there's the word Christian on the sign out front? Therefore, anything you buy in the store is automatically Christian? Is that why you're going to it? Is that why you're turned to Amy Grant? Because they said she was a Christian? Because she said she's a Christian? Or are you going by the facts? When Grant was asked for, the, for her purpose and reason for her music, she said, quote, and this is again from the Catholic Online interview, she says, I'm, all, I'm always trying to connect with people. I want to connect people with each other and the things they believe in, the love of God, forgiveness, and things that are active and alive. I sing songs about regular life, and people will say, oh, that song reminds me of Spring Break, or that song made me dance. And in the middle of those warm and fuzzies, right, she's trying to get their feelings built up, I'll sing a song that is really meant to speak to them. I'm not trying to hit them while their guard is down, but I'm trying to create a familiar landscape, and they often go, that's me, that's me. Who's it about? Me, right? Lovers of their own selves. She continues, she ends and says, and then when I sing a song that presents the gospel, <laughs> yeah, as if she actually does that, when she sing a song that presents the gospel, they go, oh my goodness, that's me too, end quote. Not, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, that's me. Oh, wow, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, oh man, God, you know, these things, how he loves people, wow, I understand that. That's really me too, you know, that's, that's, a, that's me. So, but you see, my Bible says in Psalm 50, 21, these things thou hast done and I kept silence. Uh, thou, thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself, but I will reprove thee. See, these people listen, and Amy Grant says, oh, wow, it's all about me. God, he's just like me. So all I have to do is just accept Jesus. You know, maybe say a sinner's prayer or something. Jesus is just waiting for me to accept him. Okay, I accept you. I'm going to heaven now. And then they just continue on their sin as they always did. But he's going to, set, he's going to reprove them and set them in order before his eyes. It's going to happen. In an interview with the gay and lesbian news with a gay and lesbian news reporter, it's one of those L was it L G L G B T reporters, that's what they call that. Grant describes sitting in a friend's house when relating to her thoughts on judging matters, okay? Because she doesn't want any kind of judgment over to what's right or wrong. She wants no discernment from anyone, and I'll show you what I mean. 
She says, quote, as we were sitting there trying to get quiet, she, she's talking about Grant's friend, said, it never gets still, and, I'm, and so I'm not going to get all rankled in my head. I'm just going to say, well, there's noise of the person next door blowing off, uh, blowing off their driveway with that really loud motor. There it is. There's the sound of sirens going up and down the street, she said. When we learn to observe without judgment, then we have the ability to observe and learn or to observe and be. Notice that. Observe and be. <laughs> and then it says, and I, that's Amy Grant, said, do you know how exhausting it is to observe without judgment all the, or, or excuse me, observe with judgment all the time? It's just exhausting. I have thanked her many times. We could all stand to hear that, end quote. In context, if you don't understand what she's saying here, she's saying, don't, guys, no judgment in the world. Don't judge me. Don't judge anybody else. Just, you know, observe it and and move on. Set those wicked things before your eyes, folks. That's what she's saying. And, and don't think about them. Don't think about what the Word of God says about this stuff. Folks, this is Amy Grant. 1 Corinthians 2.15 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. See, Amy Grant thinks it's foolishness to judge uh, when you're observing things. See, but, she, but, but the Bible says, Neither can he know them. She can't know them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Well, why does it say that in the end? Because if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged of God. If we're not judged of God, then we don't have a need to be judged of men. But see, oftentimes we won't judge ourselves and what we're doing wrong, and Amy Grant certainly doesn't do that. Again, John seven twenty four says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Okay? And again, we have a, if you just type in the word judge at creationliberty.com, we've got an entire article called Unbiblical Cop-Outs, Don't Judge Me. The people, don't judge me, don't judge anything. That is an unbiblical statement. That is false doctrine that's coming out of their mouths. Okay, You're not supposed to judge hypocritically, but you are supposed to judge matters. The lesbian and gay interviewer said, from photo, uh, quote, from photos I've seen and conversations I've heard, you seem to have established some close relationships with people in the gay friends of Amy Grant group on Facebook over the years. Yes, and that exists, okay? Can you describe your relationship with them? Grant says, when you've done something for a long time, there is a great familiarity that comes over the years. Now, look at how she answered that. I mean, it's, she, this woman beats around the bush so much, she is so vague in her answers. She almost never answers anything, anything directly, which is why doing research on this woman has been so grueling is because she won't directly answer a question. Anyway, let's, let's read this again. When you've done something for a long time, there's a great familiarity that comes over the years. I will say that I have a couple of friends that I made just because they came to shows for a long time, and I figure we must have some things in common because of all the music we, we're attracted to, at least we share this music in common, end quote. Even though my Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with, un together with unbelievers. What communion have light with darkness? Uh, in Romans chapter 1, it says, For this God, cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust toward one another, men were, with men working that which is unseemly. I mean, the Bible's very clear that the Sodomites... We need to sanctify ourselves from the sodomites. It's not that we can't talk to them. It's not that we can't witness to them. But I'm saying that we need to sanctify ourselves from that stuff. But that's not what Amy Grant does. She yokes up with them. Because the lesbian gay interviewer asked, quote, Weren't you invited to perform at the wedding of one of your gay friends but couldn't due to your schedule? Grant said, I was invited. I was honored to be invited, end quote. She'd be happy to go and do a gay wedding for these people. And Romans, at the end of Romans chapter 1, it says, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. These people take pleasure in people that are doing wickedness. Why? Because I believe Amy Grant is a false convert. I can't find anything about her really confessing the Lord Jesus Christ and everything about it. I can't find anything like that from her. It's all really vague. Every now and again, she'll mention, oh, yeah, we got to love God through, through Christ Jesus. You know, she might say that every now and again. But again, so does a Catholic. So does the Pope. He says the same thing. What's the difference between Amy Grant and the Pope? 
uh, from what I'm seeing, not a whole lot. I would say maybe uh, the, physically there's, there's some differences between male and female, but that's about the only thing I can see. Of the spirit, I don't see anything different. Well, maybe the Pope can't sing. Maybe that's another difference. I don't know. But 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 11 says, Now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator. Folks, if they, are in, if they are teaching and are into fornication and adultery and things like that, we're not even supposed to keep company. If they are calling themselves Christian brethren, we're supposed to set ourselves apart from them. Not to keep company, to avoid them. Don't even sit down and have a meal with them, is what the Bible says. In this gay and lesbian, lesbian interview... Amy Grant's really letting us part. She's no, she's a part of this ecumenical, all-inclusive church. She says, quote, I know that the religious community has not been very welcoming, but I just want to stress the journey of faith brings us into community. But it's really all about one relationship. The journey of faith is being willing and open to have a relationship with God, and everybody is welcome. Everybody, end quote. Okay, the religious community, we don't even know what she's referring to. Who's the religious community? And what faith is she referring to? We don't know that either, okay? And she's saying, just all are welcome. Just come as you are. If you're gay, no problem. You know, you're sodomite. Hey, you can continue to do that. Just come on into church. My Bible says in John 3, 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Know ye not that the unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. All these things, none of these shall enter the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified. What? Sanctified? You mean you're washed clean by the blood of the Lamb and we're supposed to be set apart from those people that are doing those things? Yes. But Amy Grant can't see that because she doesn't have that discernment. When talking about the fornication and referring to young women, men and women, getting to know their sexuality, here's what Amy Grant says, quote, Petting happens. It's part of growing up, finding out who you are and how men and women work. As a teenager, when I gave part of me to someone, I knew I was just going to flirt and have a little fun and do whatever I could rationalize, end quote. Because her God is is in the God of her own mind. She's using her own brain as, as the foundation for everything. That's why she's trying to rationalize all the things that she does. And this touching of each other, my, my Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, 2, Now concerning these things whereof ye wrote of me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. But that is not what Amy Grant teaches. She teaches the exact opposite of the Bible. And that's why I made this demotivational poster, which I know a lot of people are not going to like, which is the cover of her album and her, and her song called My Father's Eyes. And I put her on there with a little devil tail on the side and quoted from John 8:44, which says, Ye are of the father of the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. So make sure you understand which father she's talking about. Now, getting back to my quest to find some sort of salvation testimony, the best story I could get was when she was younger, and she said she went to a Bible study when she was 14 years old. She said, quote, That happened when I was a freshman in high school. The guy reading it, she's talking about the Bible, was dating my older sister. I thought he was the cutest thing that had ever happened in Nashville. He was nine years older than me, and I thought, Mimi, I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to steal this guy away. So I went to this Bible study thinking I was going to make this guy fall in love with me. I was for so first of all I want you to understand when she is when she's talking about sex and using her body to lure people in this has been her mentality since, since she was young. She was like this. Okay? She says, I was 14, hey, you know, but I was so overwhelmed by what they were talking about at this Bible study, I became a very serious committed Christian." End quote. Did you guys notice anything missing about this testimony about her supposedly becoming a Christian? Is there anything about the Lord Jesus Christ or sin or guilt, repentance, the law, bloodshed for her soul, anything like this? Because what Amy Grant really went to do was to steal a guy from her sister. And that's exactly what she has shown doing in the introduction of her song Baby Baby in the music video. You know, when Paul was talking in Romans chapter 7, he says, except the law had said thou shalt not covet. He says, I had not known lust except for the law said thou shalt not covet. So what's happening here is that she doesn't understand the lust of her heart because she's not been given the truth by the love of the truth by the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so continuing here, and I know I'm running over on time here, but you know I really want to finish this up today. Uh, it's so funny because I was watching this Larry King live interview with Amy Grant. The only reason they did this, it's almost a waste of time to even watch, because the only reason they did it was to try to justify themselves. They were losing tons of money from sales in their Christian sales because both of these these two got a divorce and then married each other, and they were... Um, a lot of people were really upset, and I don't think the upset was that they got a divorce. Not most people. That's not the issue. The issue was that Amy Grant was seen as this uh, very chaste symbol of Christianity. They made her into an idol, an icon, and when her idol has fallen, they lose faith in her. That's really what's been happening. It's not about that she got a divorce at all. So, Grant, in the interview, I just found something funny I wanted to share with you guys. In the interview, she said, quote, Well, I'm listening to what he's saying, and I'm thinking about this time that we were totally off the subject. We were at a some place where there was like an open mic. End quote. Literally, she cuts herself off because she almost, in, the, in this international interview, said, We were at a bar. That was almost what she said. I even I even read this quote to uh, Lorraine when I was writing all this. I was like, what do you think she was going to say? And Lorraine goes, a bar? That's what she was going to say. We all knew that's what she was about to say. And she stopped herself because she's like, that wouldn't be very good to say in front of all her Christian friends that she's, uh, uh, Christian fans she's trying to appease in order to sell more records. So she stopped from saying the word bar. And then people say, well, Chris, that's an assumption. Not at all. She told a news reporter, quote, I'm not going to say too often that I like a cold beer while watching a football game. That might bother some of my fans, end quote. And you'll probably want to type in the word alcohol in, at creationliberty.com. Uh, read our article called The Bible Versus Alcohol to see some of the more sin that Amy Grant's involved in. But she does this stuff, and the funny thing is, she would do it openly. But the only reason she hides a lot of these things she does in her life is because she's under scrutiny, and that scrutiny directly affects her paycheck. All right, And this whole thing was trying to justify her divorce, Vince Gill. I was going to talk a little bit more about this, but I think I'm going to have to say this for another time because, like I said, we're running over time a lot. But there's a lot of scripture I've given here, um, and I, I noticed a couple typos. I'm going to have to fix some, fix some things in here. But like I said, it's, it's, I've been working on this for a while, for many, many weeks now. So you're going to find a few mistakes in there, and I'm going to try to correct them as much as I can. But the fact that she divorced her first husband... She's, folks, that's sin, okay? They are one flesh. The thing that you're going to notice about the Bible is that when it says, it says in Mark chapter 10, that they twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain but one flesh. You'll notice that all the times where it talks about divorce in there, it never says that the original husband and wife that were first married never became un fleshed okay? They never departed from one another. Even when a writ of divorce is made, it doesn't say they're not one flesh, they're just not living with each other. They're just not having a relationship with one another anymore, but it doesn't mean they're not one flesh. So when they go and marry somebody else, they're continually committing adultery because they need to go back and be, and be united with the one that they were with to begin with. And a lot of people are going to be offended by that, and I'm sorry, but I'm telling you what the Bible says here. And you can go and read some of the scriptures on these things. I'm not going to share too much. Like I said, we're, we're limited on time. And I just, folks, I'm sorry, but I don't think Amy Grant is worth enough of my time to spend two separate weeks going over her. And so, but again, they're trying to justify themselves in what they're doing. Like in Jeremiah chapter 7, where, where it talks about how, you know, they, they were walking. It says, well, ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do these abominations. That's exactly what people are doing today. It says, oh, we're delivered by, by Jesus Christ, so we can just do whatever sin we want. We can just live like the devil. It says, Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. So don't lie to God about this stuff. He's watching it happen. He sees all these things. Now, Amy Grant left her husband, Gary Chapman, left him in 1998. They officially divorced in 1999. And immediately within a year, she married Vince Gill, which left many people. And when I, I didn't know about any of this, and I, read, I was reading about all this while I was doing research on it, it left me, too, with the strong suspicion that Amy Grant was fornicating with Vince while they were both married to their former spouses. Now, People Magazine reported that Vince Gill showed signs of cheating on his wife with Amy Grant in 1994. 
Janice Gill, who's more famously known as Janice Oliver, she's one of the two, her and her sister are known as the Sweethearts of Rodeo. Janice Gill, Vince's wife of 17 years and mother of his daughter Jenny, initially tolerated the close friendship he struck up with Grant after she performed at his 1993 Christmas concert. Janice's forbearance vanished the next year after she found handwritten notes from Grant in her husband's golf bag. Her sister, Christine Arnold, recalls coming home and finding a sobbing Janice parked in her driveway on the night of the discovery. She was holding a crumpled note. It said, I love you, Amy. That was the beginning of the end. After unsuccessfully begging Gill to cut his ties with Grant, Janice finally divorced him, citing irreconcilable differences in 1997, end quote. Which I could even understand, okay? She's found handwritten notes from Amy Grant to Vince Gill in the golf bag, and Vince Gill is te- telling Amy how much he loves her. This was back in 1994. Amy Grant didn't divorce Gary Chapman until 1999, Now, there is a quotation I'm going to read you here, and I need to tell you guys ahead of time, I have not been able to verify this. There's a number of websites that pointed to this quotation being accurate, but they all pointed to a source that no longer exists, at least on the internet. I don't know exactly where this came from. If anybody, I tried to look around for a way to contact Gary Chapman. I can't find a way to do that. If anybody finds a way or knows Gary Chapman or something, if you can verify this quote for me, just ask him if, if he said this. I'd appreciate that. That would be that would be uh, wonderful if you could provide that, but I don't know how to get a hold of the guy. But I have been told that, first of all, that he got on his knees and begged Amy to stay, and she wouldn't do it, number one. And number two, I would have to say that there's other quotations I did not put on here about what Gary Chapman's had to say about some of this, because he said, look, he agreed with Amy not to do this he said, she said thing and start all start this little gossip war back and forth. He says, but the media turned it into she said. Whatever Amy says, that's the way it was, according to the media. So Gary Chapman was personally asked a question. He says, would you tell us whether or not she was probably having an affair behind your back? Because a lot of us suspect it. Could you, tell, could you answer that for us? Gary Chapman, I've been told, responded, Could I answer? Yeah. Will I answer? Probably not. I think by Amy's admission, they've been very dear friends for years. I suspect most people can add, I'll leave that to their mathematical abilities. (laughs) Okay. What does that tell you? I very strongly suspect that he suspect, yeah, they were having an affair long, long before they ever uh, divorced. And from this article from ABC News, it said, quote, When Amy Grant and Vince Gill sang a duet for her 1994 album, House of Love, he was the king of country and she was the queen of Christian pop. The pair met to record a video for the song, and sparks flew. I think a part of me loved him instantly, Grant said. Both singers were married to other people at the time and had children, and their commitment to their families and their fans meant their romance was doomed before it could grow. I felt like I knew him instantly. I was so moved by him as a human being that I I went up behind him and just hugged him as hard as I could while he was singing. I just said, I needed to hug you all night. Gill says he wrote his 1995 song, Whenever You Come Around, with Grant in mind. The face of an angel, pretty eyes that shine, the song goes. I lie awake at night wishing you were mine, end quote. Well, I will leave that to your imaginations then. I did not quote this to start an effort of some gossip chain, folks. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I'm trying to demonstrate here that Amy Grant does not live the way she claims she believes. You might hear some songs that have some gospel in them every now and again, but she doesn't live by that concept. She does not have a philosophical mindset after Christ. She has it after the world. She doesn't believe the things she's singing about, okay? Now, she does in some of her New Age music, but if you have anything that's got any gospel in it, she doesn't believe that. She believes in a different Jesus Christ. And the whole, I mean, they lied. Vince Gill and Amy Grant went onto the camera, lied to everybody about this whole thing, and they had one and only one purpose in doing so. And this is from Crosswalk, quote, In the wake of Grant's divorce, many Christian media outlets, including Christianity International, Today International, avoided doing Amy Grant stories. Many Christian radio stations and bookstores refused to play her music or sell her records, end quote. The entire thing was about the love of money. In 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It does not say money is evil, it says the love of money is evil, because money doesn't have a conscience. And it says, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Amy Grant is about preserving her money and her fame. 
And not to mention, I mean, you think about all the Christmas albums she has done. As far as I counted, and I could be completely wrong about this, I counted about 20 original albums she's done. Five of those were Christmas albums. So 25% of what she's actually produced has been honoring paganism, has been honoring a false sun god. That's what she's been writing about. And then, of course, including all these wicked people singing with her like Elvis Presley. And, and, and here's the thing. The Lord Jesus Christ, they, they think at all their Christmas time, these people, their Christmas, their Easter celebrations, all this, when they lift up their hands to God, they think, God sees me. And they pray to God, oh, God is hearing my words. And they sing to God, oh, God is hearing our songs. We're just praise and worshiping God. But that's not what my Bible says, because in Amos chapter 5, right after God gets, gets done describing their wicked works and their pagan practices, he says in verse 23, Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. And in Isaiah chapter 1, he does the same thing, describes their pagan practices. And in verse 15, it says, And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make pray many prayers, I will not hear. My Bible says the opposite of what these people believe. My Bible says that God will not hear them. He's not going to see them when they're lifting up their hands. He's not going to listen to the melody of their songs. Because they're doing wickedness. Okay? And so we need to be careful that we are pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ. And in order to do that, we first have to turn to his word to get a foundation of what we are supposed to believe, what we are supposed to teach, and what we are supposed to sing. And I, I've got to say, you know, wrapping up here, and I know, I know I went over time, I'm sorry about that, but to wrap this up, I've got to say, it has been incredibly difficult. I spent, the reason why this took me weeks and weeks and weeks to get all this information onto this, and I hope you guys will take advantage of it and share it with some other people, because we can't, I can't really get people to read these articles. They love their music idols so much, they worship their music idols so much, they will not hear one word that would dare question whether or not they're actually Christians. They're not going to listen to any of it. But, but researching Amy Grant has been incredibly difficult because her answers are so vague. I'll give you an example. The, the lesbian gay interviewer said, quote, How do you respond to people when they ask you about your feelings on gay marriage? Amy Grant said, In the same way that I did not tell one person who I voted for, I don't. I never talk about anything like that, end quote. That's why you can't find out what Amy Grant really believes on a lot of issues. That's why it's hard to do that, because she avoids all topics that would dare offend anyone, that would dare to stand on the Word of God and take a firm foundation on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ, in Revelation chapter 3, said, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I word that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Jesus Christ is going to spit her out of his mouth, because he can't stand people that are writing the fence and that's what they're doing okay and they ask her other questions you know I, I there's this uh, this article that comes out of politics daily that asks her how did she keep her hair so perfectly curled and not frizz in the rain it's these pathetic little questions that they're asking her that i can't find the real information i want to find about her and then when you write them trying to ask basic questions like how can you be saved you won't get an answer she even, asked, I mean, listen to this one so far. You, oh, you guys are going to love this one from Politics Daily because I kept reading that article about one to see what I could find. It says, quote, I asked how she thought President Obama was performing so far. This is Amy Grant being asked this question. She paused for almost a minute, then said, I've been praying hard for him. Now, listen, almost 60 seconds she's in silence thinking. She says, I've been praying hard for him for his health care reform. Yeah, you heard that right. For Obamacare. She's been praying that Obamacare would get passed. Asked if she agreed with the specific reforms in Congress now, she said that she thinks that health care reform is eventually going to be a good thing. Still, she hadn't answered the question about Obama. Oh, lo and behold, she didn't answer a question? Yeah, that's what I keep reading in all these interviews. But it continues and says, How does she think he's doing as a president? Grant answered, I think he'll do a great job. End quote. That was in 2009. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, and that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that do these things. And that's exactly what Amy Grant does. When Amy Grant is made aware that there is a there's an issue of contradiction that's going on, where there is somebody who is preaching against what she does and what she teaches, okay, 
A reporter asked her about that at BeliefNet. He said, quote, What do you wish your evangelical critics knew about your more mainstream music? Grant responds, I think music is just a, is such a beautiful thing. It lifts the heart at... It lifts the heart and buoys your, up your spirits all kinds of music. I just think people should find the music that helps them through the day and enjoy that. I've never felt like it's a morality issue, end quote. So what are, is her response to evangelical critics like myself who I'm going in and showing where she's not really of God, she's not really of the Lord Jesus Christ, she doesn't believe on him, she was never saved. How, okay... She thinks, well, this is this has nothing to do with moral issues. Oh, contraire. Listen, Miss Grant, if you ever get to hear this or somebody sends this to you, I pray that this, this teaching or this word, this article maybe that I've made will get directly in your hands somehow so you can receive a clear biblical rebuke that a true Christian's objection with you is not your melodies. It's your offense to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ through your false doctrine and wicked deeds which you make every effort to hide from the public. And having no repentance, that's godly sorrow, that you have done anything wrong in the sight of God and portraying a lie that you are a born-again Christian who believes on the word of God when you are not. Okay, the Bible says that you know the Lord will not, take, will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Exodus 27 says, in Mark chapter 7, it said, How be it they in vain do they worship me, teaching for the doctrines the commandments of men. And he said unto them, Full well we, ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. That's exactly what Amy Grant does. She teaches false doctrine for the sake of filthy lucre. And then people walk around thinking that she's a Christian somehow. When Look, you can say that she's a Christian till you're blue in the face, but the evidence is on my side here. If you want to make a positive statement about someone being a Christian, you better put forth the evidence. And if you're going to say, well, she's saying El Shaddai. That did, I said, okay, where in the scripture does it say, if you sing a song about Christianity, therefore you're a born-again Christian? Where did Jesus Christ say that? Because, look, Jesus Christ told them to beware of the doctrine that they're going to be teaching. That's one of the main ways that we can see who is of God and who is not, is the doctrine that they're teaching lining up with the word of God. And I challenge you guys to read all the verses that I gave you. Go back and read the chapters of all the verses I gave you. And compare it with the words that, that's coming out of Amy Grant's mouth here. Don't take my word for it. Go and read these issues yourself. Read these quotations. Compare them yourselves. Be a Berean. Like in Acts 17.11. John 15.19 says, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Folks, the world does not hate Amy Grant. They love her dearly. Is that not a demonstration in of itself? I mean, do you think I would ever be given all these awards that, that she's been given? Do you think I would ever be invited to all these huge uh, political parties that she's invited to, to introduce these wicked speakers? Do you think I would ever be invited to these things? Not a chance. Not a chance. Why? Because I'll rebuke the people. That in the place where I'm at. I'm going to rebuke these people and tell them the truth, and they don't want that. They want to be entertained. And Amy Grant is happy to entertain them and keep them blind as they walk through the wide gate of destruction. Folks, if you have a heart for Amy Grant, you know, some of you might have a heart for her and say, she's just such a, you know, a beautiful lady, beautiful singer, and I have a heart for her God that I want her to be saved, then pray that she would be saved, that he would be as long-suffering with her and give her every opportunity to hear the truth but be saved before it's too late. The same goes for Billy Graham, for Rick Warren, for Michael W. Smith, anybody else we've done these wolves and costume articles on. Okay, and if those of you who have not seen those, go to our website and into the article section. There's a section called Wolves in Costume. Click on that, and we got a whole list of them. And we're going to we're going to keep making more of these because we want to expose the people who for who they are. And that way, I mean, if we don't know that these people are not born again Christians, how can we pray for their souls in the right way to the Lord God with understanding? But you see, right now, Amy Grant's no different than any of the other people I just mentioned because. Uh, they're, put, they're all pushing for this New Age, one-world religion of the Antichrist, and they care nothing for the souls of the lost. So we have to pray that they would be saved and give praise to God that he's been long-suffering with all of us because we were in that uh, position at one point, just as Paul taught. And it says, but now we are washed clean. Okay, And so we should walk in the light and do the good, do the, the good works of God and teach what's right, not just... Taken in, and, and, and be careful that what we're listening to, folks, you keep taking this false doctrine into yourselves, you're going to start repeating it over and over. Okay? 
And I'm sorry I had to cut some things short uh, and skip over some things in the article, but again, you guys can go back and read that, understand more of that on your own time. Anybody want to make any comments or, or have any questions before we close out today? I just wanted to say that I remember um, an interview that Katy Perry did where she said she wanted to be the Amy Grant of gospel music, and when it didn't happen that way, she sold her soul, she sold her soul to the devil. That's really weird. I've never heard of that before. But Katy Perry... There's I mean, several video clips of it on YouTube. Wow. I have, I'll have to look that up because Katy Perry, I didn't, I really didn't know anything about her. And, and some stuff was popping up. Um, I saw like advertisements for thing, different things about Katy Perry while I was doing research on Amy Grant. And well, Both of her parents are evangelists. I didn't know that either. And the thing yeah, is... Well, they're, they're kind of in the New Age Christianity type stuff oh. too. I didn't know that either. I'd, I'd have to do some more. Re I don't really know much about the, the about the woman, but I did see a video of some performance she did at uh, an awards ceremony, and the the funny, I had to laugh at one point because well, it was wicked as could possibly be. I mean, I I didn't even watch much of it. I, basically, it had this full moon was rising that behind the her, and she's got. Horse one? Yeah, that's what it was called. I couldn't remember. Where they were doing the pole dances on witches' brooms and. At the end, she had this um, Knights of Templar cross lit up on her costume. I know that I didn't. I didn't watch it that far. I watched it for maybe like twenty seconds, and I said, "I've had enough of this." And I, but I went down to the comments. Even secular people who have no knowledge of God, one of the guys sat back and say, "Did did she just summon Satan?" <laughs> He's like, "Did did we just witness them summoning up hell?" And I was thinking, "Well, probably." Okay, and that's I don't know what all that was about, but it's definitely has to do with her trying to promote herself sexually and talking about all sorts of witchcraft. Because I went afterwards and read some of the lyrics to her song, and it's as wicked as it can possibly be. Anyway, sorry that I guess that's getting we're not talking about Katy Perry too much, but like you said, she wanted to be the Amy Grant of gospel. Well, still, whether she whether Katy Perry's in what she's doing now or following after Amy Grant, it, she st they're still in the same boat. I mean, they still need to be born again, okay? And But it is interesting that you brought the point that that was kind of, Amy Grant was her influence. I need to go look that up and probably add that to the article. So I appreciate you giving me that information. So anybody else have any other questions or comments before we close out? Well, other than the whole Katy Perry thing, I was going to say that, uh, well, thanks to the, the image Amy Grant, and I'm Actually, that I'm glad she brought that up because that kind of like proves my point that you know she's a false convert, bringing up other false converts, and even what she did, that, that's nasty. I'm sorry, I'm I'm stuck on the the, the Katy Perry thing, but basically, it's pretty much the same. She's just the she's a false convert that's bringing up false converts, and really, you know, it's uh, I know I've said this before. It makes it really difficult for for us or of true born-again Christians to, to lead others or bring about others because now they have this false image on what a Christian does or, sh or should do or, 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 you know, it's, it's okay for them to do this kind of stuff. It's not. Yeah, and, uh, and it just, that, what you're saying there, it just goes back to remind me of Amy Grant's psalm, all I ever have to be, you know? I don't have to do anything. If, you know, if I, I try at all to, to be anything better, that's out of your plan, you know? We don't have to. We don't have to be good. We just live in our sin, and there's no, no problem with that. You know, and it's like you have guys that people that look at look at us weird. You know, when we when we tell them the truth or do it right, and it's like, well, basically the rest of the world, guys who claim that they're Christian, they do this. You know, and then it's like, you know, it, it's it it becomes really hard about somebody who has no name in the world trying to show the truth against somebody who has a big name in the world, and that's all it takes to justify, you know, somebody who's wrong. Exactly. They're using that person to justify themselves, which, by the way, we can turn around and say to them, okay, is Amy Grant the final authority in all matters of faith and practice? Is Michael W. Smith the final authority in all matters of faith and practice? I ask people those kind of questions often. You realize how few people I've had answer it? When I ask them that question, I mean, when they try to use somebody or themselves to justify it, I, I even ask, you know, they said, well, this is not how I feel about it. And I say, okay, are, is your heart, your feelings, the final authority in all matters of faith and practice? I can't get people to answer that question because 
they know the answer to it is either going to be nonsensical or they've got to turn to the Word of God, and they definitely don't want to do that. So I understand exactly where you're coming from on that one. It's very, I don't want to say it's difficult to deal with them, but it's very frustrating. I'll say that. So anyway, any, any other questions or comments before we close today? All right, well, thanks for joining us this week, everybody. May our Lord Jesus Christ bless you all as you study his word to glorify him, and we will see you next week.